Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the planning section of the authority. Uh, we begin with item 13.1, which is application 629-23006, proposed demolition of existing bungalow and sheds, erection of replacement eco bungalow and new shed at Hellstone Elephant Minehead. We begin with a presentation which is going to be made by mm -hmm. Mr. White. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this development proposal was deferred at the Authority Committee meeting in October last year, and that followed a member site visit. So a lot of members here today have been out to the site. Members would have noted from the description of the proposed development that the application is a resubmission of a previously withdrawn application, which was initially considered in uh, to, uh, 2021. Now, further to the deferral of the current application, the applicant has made changes to the proposal including bringing the car parking within the existing garden area and by slightly shortening the proposed length of the replacement dwelling. The applicant has advised that he made changes following the advice of the previous head of planning. Now in terms of this slide um, and for the avoidance of doubt, the application site relates to Helston Bungalow which is at the northern extent of the red line boundary as we see it on the screen. The existing building lies in open countryside and that's obviously to the north of, of Bossington. The application red line site includes the access from Bossington, which obviously shows why it's such a linear site. So the access coming out of Bossington is included in the red line. That is over Helston Lane, over which the southwest coast path also passes, and it leads past the site, which we'll see later on some photographs. The site is considered to be a sensitive location, given its remote location away from other built forms, its position within the Heritage Coast designation, and its proximity to the um, Exmoor Coastal Heath Triple SI and the Exmoor Heath Special Area of Conservation. By way of update to the committee report, we have received fur uh, four further letters of objection, which aren't reported in the report itself. And those letters raise matters similar to those points already noted in the report under the representations section. This slide is picking up the site in, in more detail. Just so it's a bit clearer, you can see Halston Bungalow just where the cluster is there and obviously with the access coming out of, of Bossington itself. This is an existing site plan. It shows the existing bungalow is this building here. There's an extant planning permission on the site to build a garage and that's actually shown in the dotted line just to the left of the bungalow. The building itself isn't on site but there is a, a concrete pad and the proposal also includes demolition of some sheds further to the north in the, in the land next to the, the building itself. This is uh, existing elevation, so it's the west at the top elevation uh, and the, the bottom of the side of the east elevation of the existing building. And it's also picking up again in the dotted outline the, the garage building, uh, which is to say not on the site, but there is an extant plan to build that. That's sat next, next, next to it. The existing building is timber clad. It's small scale, low height materials and weathered appearance, uh, as well as its plain form, mean that it is relatively discreet in its setting and it has a subdued appearance. That's each, each gable end of the building. So the south elevation, the south gable is, is the top part, the bottom part of the plan is picking up on the northern elevation. The drawing also picks up, if I focus on the, the south elevation here, it picks up the position of the, the southwest coast path. There's an outline of a person still on the path. Um, so obviously the, the site is, is sat up in relation to the, the coast path. And views obviously then of the building tend to be up into the, the, the site. And beca perhaps because of that, you know, changes in scale become more noticeable as you pass by the site along the coast path. That's picking up a floor plan as well as sort of the wider site. The accuracy, the accuracy of the plans have been disputed. Nonetheless, it's clear that the existing dwelling is less than 93 square metres and it has a floor area of around 65 square metres. Now we'll just flick through some, photos, some some plans of the proposed scheme. So that is the proposed uh, site plan. You 
You can see the parking within the site now, just to the left of the proposed building. And the dwelling itself would be over the footprint of the existing bungalow. So that's some elevations. That's the west elevation at the, the, the top of the slide. So that's the, the elevation towards the, the, the coast path. So it passes with the east elevation at the bottom. It obviously would be a, still a single story building. It would have a linear form with, as well as a sort of stepped roof and elevation. It would have a larger footprint than the existing building, although it would still be less than 93 square metres overall. The building would, would be timber clad with reclaimed grey tile um, clay roof tiles and those there would be solar panels within the roof you can just see them on the plan at the top here and they would be sat within the tiles so they're integrated within the roof part of the west elevation uh, incorporates a veranda to reflect the feature on the uh, on the existing building um, and the west elevation here which is a more open elevation does include more extensive uh, um, glazing than than, as, than is present on the site at the moment. This is the end gables. So again, it's the south elevation at the top, the north elevation at the below. And you can begin to see on this one, that's sort of the lower section of the building just here. And then it steps up as you go into the, the site. And this is the, obviously, again, the, the south elevation. The veranda in here, coastal path just below. And the applicant does propose some additional planting along that boundary to try and help um, provide some screening for the proposed building. Again, that's the, the floor plan. Pick up the parking next door and the southwest coast path running along the western side of the site along the bottom of that slide. The proposals include uh, um, an outbuilding. Uh, the outbuilding would accommodate uh, a biomass boiler as well as um, storage for the solar power panel batteries and some domestic equipment storage. The roof space within the building is proposed as a, as a bat roof as part of mitigation of the scheme. It would also be constructed in materials to match the, the host dwelling. And I think it's fair to reflect that overall that building itself would be of a, a scale subservient to the dwelling, the proposed dwelling, although it would constitute um, or contribute to the overall building mass within the site. So just for the next few slides, we look at a bit of a comparison between the two. The top part of the plan here is the proposed site plan against the existing site plan just at the bottom. And then left and right, to the left-hand side, this plan is picking up the, 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 the layout, the, the footprint of the existing bungalow. The right-hand side is picking up the proposed development and you can begin to see actually that it is obviously much, a much greater linear um, form within that site. Again, so that's the, the, the west elevation there. Proposed at the top, existing below. Again, that picks up the, the garage in the dotted outline, but the garage building is not um, present on site as it stands at the moment. Um, the proposed dwelling would be more than nine metres longer in that elevation compared to the existing, and it would be more than one and a half metres taller at the tallest point of the, the ridge line here. So this element is more than a metre and a half taller than, than that element on the existing bungalow. Members will also note that um, the proposed scheme would have more windows, which are also larger, and therefore introduce the greater potential for light spill. Uh, and th that brings, I guess, the, the greater potential for the building to be more obvious, particularly during winter months, with the backdrop of the dark hillside behind. And that's uh, the south elevation <coughs> existing to the left-hand side proposed to the right-hand side. The proposed dwelling would have a, a sort of a tapered uh, elevation, and its maximum depth would be slightly shallower than the existing <coughs> dwelling when having regard to its veranda on the front here. So just on some photographs of the site, this is a view stood on the southwest coast path looking up and obviously we can see that what would be the northern gable of the existing bungalow there with the veranda <coughs> along the front. That's moved slightly further down, so now it's sort of picking up the end of the south gable. Looking at the access, the pedestrian access into the site, the proposal would see that access moved 
Um, and I, I guess the, the landscape along the front there would be um, increased uh, with, with, with planting to help sort of soften the view from the coast path. That's picking up that west elevation as stood on the coast path. Again, similar view. It's a northern gable. And then this is just picking up some shots of the access into the site. It's on Hurlston Lane, obviously this is the southwest coast path. And that's a view looking back towards Bossington and towards where the, the Ford crossing is. It's just off the shop, but the Ford crossing is just around the corner there. So vehicles or access into the site is up this track, up towards the bungalow. That's a similar position, moved further towards the bungalow, but still looking back towards Bossington. So it creeps up over a, a, a raid section next to the river there. These shots are it's like turned around, looking now in the direction of the bungalow. It's a track coming along, probably an access to, to farmland there, but the, the access to the bungalow itself is to the right-hand side, and then along this track down through here. The next photograph, just for a bit of reference, is actually stood roughly here, so it's just a view from that point, just picking up how it sort of bends around and then up towards the bungalow itself. That's a view out from the veranda, so looking down towards Bossington Beach, it's just really picking up, there is some vegetation there, so it would, would break up the view. Obviously from Bossington Beach it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly distant view, but it would nonetheless be detectable from on the beach itself. The southwest coast path is just below here in that photograph. And the next, the last photograph is actually stood on the, the coast path itself, but showing the view out, the bungalow is behind the person taking the photograph in this position. Um, so Chairman, just in terms of me drawing to a close, it's fair to reflect that the applicant has sought to work with officers. Indeed, the applicant has pointed out that the application was initially recommended for approval by officers when being prepared for the committee meeting in October. He has also highlighted that amendments have been made that have been made in line with recommendations given by the former Head of Planning. Nevertheless, the previous recommendation is considered to be a finely balanced one and the plans of the existing dwelling have been amended to show a lower height than initially uh, had been shown to be the case and had been considered. Members have a detailed report before them, uh, and that is based on the plans now submitted. The report considers whether the residential use of the dwelling um, is abandoned and finds that although the dwelling has not been occupied, or has been unoccupied, sorry, the residential use of the site is lawful, the replacement of the existing dwelling is judged to be acceptable in principle under policy HCD 17 of the local plan. However, the report highlights two key areas of concern. These are the impact of the proposed development on the character and appearance of the area and the potential impact of development on foraging and commuting bats. Even though the proposed dwelling would replace an existing dwelling, it would result in an increase in mass and the scale of the original dwelling. It would be taller and longer and it would constitute a substantial increase in size and scale of the house on the site. The relative modesty of the existing residential building scale and appearance would be lost from the site, and the proposed houses' stepped design and more extensive fenestration would draw the eye. Consequently, within the predominantly natural and undeveloped setting of this remote site, the development is considered to cause substantial harm to the character and appearance of the area. Moreover, due to the more extensive glazing, and potential for light spill, on the evidence currently available, officers are not satisfied that the proposal would not lead to harm to foraging and commuting bats within the vicinity of the site. The report considers other matters that have been raised, including the access to the site and flood risk. But having regard to the existing use of the site as a residential dwelling, officers do not find harm in respect of these. The planning balance at page 34 of the agenda papers balances the planning merits of the scheme and concludes that the benefits that would arise would not outweigh the harms identified. Accordingly, Chairman, it is recommended that the Planning Commission be refused for the reasons given on page 35. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr White. There are a number of members of the public who wish to speak uh, today. Um, there will be, as usual, two minutes for most of the speakers, but... Um, Ms. Shorten is speaking on behalf of a number of local residents, and as a result of that, uh, she will be allowed to speak for five minutes uh, collectively, and also, in the interest of balance, the applicant, Mr. Carew, will also be allowed to speak for five minutes. So, the first speaker this afternoon is Dorian Bickerstaff. So, if 
Mr. Bickerstaff would come to the microphone. Um, if you could just check that it's on, please, and then you'll have two minutes from when you start to speak. Hello, okay? That's all here? Yes. Okay. It's probably easier if you sit down, Mr. Bickerstaff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, right. Um, I've lived in Boddington for 43 years. Uh, it's uh, remained unspoilt for all the time I've lived there. And we've got to thank yourselves and the National Trust, who own most of the properties in Boddington. It's a hamlet with a single track road leading in and out and going nowhere else. We have never had any new builds since I have been here. Uh, the wooden bungalow that is at present on the site was put there for local workforce, along with two other bung wooden bungalows that were demolished in the 60s. These were brought down from Nutska Reservoir for local residents, workers to live in. The River Horner joins the River Aller to make Boddington waters, and through the winter, the river becomes almost impossible to cross with a vehicle. Um, it can reach a depth of five feet. At the moment, it's only two foot, but very fast flowing, which would still be very difficult to cross. Uh, the only access to the cabin is along the southwest coastal path, a narrow path that can only take a normal sized vehicle. If a building the size of the intended plan were to be approved, this path would be severely damaged and the access for walkers uh, severely hampered. Um, Richard Robbins used to live there until 2006. He was a shy bachelor and uh, he used a small T20 Ferguson tractor and he would once a week come out to the car park where his Land Rover was parked and the vegetables he used to grow he used to sell in the village and then do his weekly shop. The plan for this new build would be a blot on a beautiful landscape and also the lighting would severely damage the beautiful dark skies of the area. The, the applicant has shown he has no regard for the ecology of the area by cutting down trees that did not belong to him in front of the site. Oh, where were you? You know, Thank you very much. Mr. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Susan Bamford. Thank Could you. Could I allocate my time to Sarah Shorten, please? Um, I, I'm afraid I, I, I can't add any more to, to Miss um, Shorten's time. Um, if you would like to come to speak to okay. us now, you'd be very welcome to, if you could. If possible, I would like to allocate my time to... Um, Somebody else. Would yeah, it I'm afraid at, uh, at this stage uh, okay. I'm, I'm unable to do that. So if I you could speak now, that would be yeah, okay. uh, very good. Thank you. Um. So again, you'll have up to two minutes from when you start speaking. Sorry? You'll have up to two minutes from when you start speaking, but okay. don't feel you have to take all of that time if you don't want to. Okay. Um. Oh, I need to turn it on, do I? No, it's, it's on. It's off. It's off. I beg your pardon. <laughs> um, what really concerns me about this um, this construction plan is the traffic management side and the damage to the environment leading up to the the, the old bungalow site. Um, has any calculation ever been made of the quantity, weight and frequency of the long-standing um, traffic use in the past and any comparison with the planned use during the construction period to enable calculation on the effect on the Ford and earth and stone tracks which are extremely delicate we say because they are only earth and stone and as well as as well as after construction the subsequent daily usage by domestic vehicles to and from the proposed home up the bridal way pathway track and has any calculation been made of the disruption to walkers and riders 
on the southwest coast path between Bossington and Minehead, in particular during the construction period. Sorry, that, that's all. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mrs. Uh, Penelope Kellum. Mrs. Kellum, you'll have two minutes from when you start to speak. Good morning. The committee bears a great weight of responsibility in making this decision, as the proposed development is entirely incongruous and would have a hugely adverse impact on the character and visual amenity of the area from the southwest coast path, from the beach and from the sea. It represents overdevelopment of a very sensitive site. Were it to be allowed, the building would be a scar on this beautiful, tranquil landscape for potentially hundreds of years. The Exmoor coast ranks amongst the most unspoilt and best protected stretches of coastline in England and Wales. It is visited by many thousands of people each year. If this proposed overdevelopment were allowed, it is likely that many of them would ask, who on earth allowed that to be built? The building proposes a large elongated bungalow with huge windows, a purely optional design choice. It is a very tall building, again a purely optional design choice, based on the choice of a particular type of tile. There are many other roofing materials available which would enable, enable a much lower pitch. Does this proposal comply with the planning policies laid out to protect Exmoor National Park? The National Trust, CPRE, and your own planning officer say no. If it does not comply, you must surely refuse permission. Does this proposal respect the wildlife of the National Park? Exmoor National History Society and your wildlife officer say no. If it does not, you must surely refuse permission. Does this proposal enhance the landscape of this beautiful, highly sensitive site? The landscape officer says no. If it does not, you must surely refuse permission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Kellum. And our next speaker is Dr. Ian Kellum. Uh, Dr. Kellum, you'll have two minutes from when you start to speak. Thank you. In our opinion, this is being sold as an eco-house, but we do not feel it is an eco-house. It is indeed off-grid, but we'll have a fossil fuel generator running nearly all of the winter, simply because we have done the calculations based on the actual weather station in Bossington and know the amount of electricity that could be generated from those solar panels on the roof. Therefore, there will be fumes and noise throughout a tremendous part of the year. The development will also bring, of course, fossil fuel vehicles to the southwest coast park, which is currently enjoyed in peace and tranquility by young children playing by the river and the ford, and by all ages enjoying gentle walks along Helston Point and those walking the southwest coast park in its entirety. Also, this is not a local, low-cost home for a local family. It's a modern executive bungalow, with expen very expensive to build and far beyond the reach of most local families. This is not a self-build. It's a bungalow designed by a professional architect. Were the house to be rebuilt on this site, a new septic tank would be required, and it's clear from the National Trust that they have not given their permission for this to be built on their land, which would be necessary, and that the planning permission would be required for this. Furthermore, the National Trust don't have an agreement, as far as we're aware, with the applicant for the field to the north of the property. They have, in fact, requested he should create his own access entirely on his own land to safeguard the property, since there's no guarantee the National Trust would lease the area to the north to him. I encourage the committee to reject the application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kellum.
Our next speaker is Gillian Laramie on behalf of Peter Laramie. Um, Sarah Shorten has got my minute. Okay, thank you very much. In that case, uh, Jeff Garfield, Mr. Garfield, uh, a local resident and area representative of the Southwest Coast Path Association. Mr. Garfield will have two minutes from when you start to speak. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the South Southwest Coast Path Association, uh, which is a charity of over 8,000 members um, which supports um, the Coast Path. We object to this application because it will cause severe detriment <coughs> to the Southwest Coast Path, which is really important to the whole of the Southwest. It brings in 9 million visitors a year generating £500 million worth of spend and supporting 11,000 jobs. Um, so, and it is of great benefit to Exmoor because we have the iconic first stretch of the coast path. So what detriment would there be? Well, as we've heard, it would spoil the peaceful landscape. It would develop a la uh, um, increased light spill and it would create a real danger to users of the coast path. The narrow access uh, uh, bridle way is only wide enough for one vehicle. Any walkers must just get out of the way and they have a choice between a steep bank or a steep drop. How do children, buggies and people with limited mobility manage? If that's not enough reason for you to reject it, I would draw your attention to your stated objectives. The purpose of the National Park to enhance and conserve the natural beauty, wildlife and access, public access to the coast path. This application does none of those things and I would urge you to reject it. <coughs> Thank you very much Mr Garfield. Our next speaker is Fletcher Robinson um, on behalf of the CPRE. Mr. Robinson, you'll have two minutes from when you start to speak. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I am a trustee and the planner for TPRE Somerset. Um, we strongly agree with the case officer that the house's stepped and elong elongated form and extensive fenestration would draw the eye, resulting in a visually jarring intrusion of conspicuous built form in the tranquil undeveloped landscape of the coastal path. The overarching policy requirement is GP1 achieving national park purposes and sustainable development. This specifically says that all proposals for new development will demonstrate that they do not conflict with other policies in the development plan and this clearly isn't the case in, in our view. For example, the estimated 88% in proposed increase in frontage plainly does not comply with the replacement buildings policy, HCD17. The scaling mass and height are all non-compliant. Secondly, the proposed fenestration is an estimated five times as much as the fenestration on the existing bungalow. The light will be visible for miles, particularly in winter. This will harm the undeveloped, remote and tranquil landscape character of this sensitive location. In our view, the proposal is plainly not compliant with policy CEF2, protecting Exmoor's dark skies, nor with CES1, landscape and seaside character. In our view, the proposal should be refused so, so that a new proposal can come forward for a modest bungalow of the same dimensions and appearance and fenestration area as the present one. And if it can only have one to two <coughs> bedrooms due to modern space standards, then so be it. Thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. And our next speaker is Sarah Shorten, who is speaking <coughs> on behalf of a number of local residents. Um, Ms. Shorten, you'll have five minutes from when you start to speak. So I co-coordinate a group of 100 households that are based in Selworthy and Minehead without and Porlock parishes. We all strongly object to this application. Our group is diverse. There are newcomers, those who've lived in the villages 
for a long time. Younger residents, families, those who are retired, those who are tech and non-tech literate who cannot follow this application online have knocked on my door to express their concerns. Over 50 of us atten uh, attended the site meeting and over 100 attended the consultation meeting in Corlock. There is a high level of anxiety about this application in our community. Why is this? How is a sense of place created? We would argue that the walk from Bossington Car Park along Halston Lane and beside the bungalow is pivotal to that. It is quiet, teeming with wildlife, undisturbed and unassuming. This is an extremely sensitive and important site for us as a community. Ours is not a campaign against the applicant. We are motivated by a love of this site. Therefore, we ask for the highest standards of scrutiny and rigour in this case, and if not for this site, then where? We're really pleased to read Joe White's report recommending refusal. It echoes many of the points that we have been steadfastly been making since submission of the first application in December 2021 and contained in our critique of the previous officer's report. We thank him for his work. We feel listened to and we feel consulted with. We note no statutory consultee is in favour of this application. The National Trust, CPRE, South West Coastal Path Association, your offices for future landscapes and wildlife conservation. This application, we feel it's important to note, has been characterised by inaccuracies and omissions. Only recently in January, we discovered that the existing building has been misdrawn ultimately misrepresented, it is smaller than that which was on the original drawings. We are grateful to the applicant for amending it, <coughs> but ultimately we see a building which is 0.75 metres lower in ridge height and the chimney is 0.8 metres lower. Ultimately this creates a difference, as Joe White has pointed out, of height of 1.8 metres. As you sit below it and look up, that is the height difference that we are looking at. So our objections mirror Joe White's. We are concerned about the scale and massing. We consider this building to be 40 square metres. The existing, it would increase to 96 square metres, the western frontage that looks down upon the southwest coast path. Add the shed to that. That's one... That's one look that you didn't get of the building and the shed. If you add the shed, the western frontage becomes 126 metres of new build. Looking down, that's three times the existing small western frontage of the bungalow. You're below it. You look above. It's magnified. It's to the detriment of everyone using the southwest coast park. We are also concerned about fenestration, as others have mentioned, and we would argue that you cannot condition for a hedge height, a screenless design, that you cannot condition for curtains to be closed to reduce light spill. In conclusion, our community feels the current application is an overdevelopment of this site and is insensitive to the primary feature of the National Park, which is landscape. We have stood beside your officers and consultees to try and raise technical planning considerations and we now ask you for a common sense decision. Please refuse this scheme to allow for a more modest, sympathetic design to come forward. Thank you very much, Ms. Shorten. Our next speaker is Mrs. Laura Carew, and I think she's just been fetched. Mrs. Carew, uh, if you could come to the table, please. You will have two minutes okay. from when you start to okay. speak. Can I turn this on? It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. We are an Exmoor family and fiercely protective of this landscape. 
We too are worried about insensitive overdevelopment. But this is not that. The bungalow was about to be put up for auction when Ivo and Harriet bought it. And whoever was going to buy it was going to have to rebuild it as it's unsalvageable. Luckily for everyone, it was bought by them, not a cynical developer, but a young, idealistic couple who wanted to build something beautiful and sustainable and contribute to the community. This is emphatically not a grand design project, not ostentatious, not gimmicky, not meretricious and out of keeping. No concrete forecourts or outside lighting. They are passionate believers in dark skies but instead a modest and sensitive rethinking of a charming wooden bungalow using traditional materials. It is intended not to detract, but to gracefully inhabit the wooded landscape, where it can really only be seen from the path when you're standing directly in front. With their beehives and vegetable patch, it should be loved just as <coughs> the existing cottages in Bossington are. The planning process has, for this has taken two and a half years during which they've had one baby and, a, and are expecting another imminently. Meanwhile, building costs have escalated terrifyingly. Furthermore, they have had to suffer <coughs> distressing, shameful, online abuse and poison pen letters, when all they were trying to do was to quite reasonably replace a rotten wooden bungalow with a new wooden bungalow for their family. They have taken note of all the concerns that have been raised, the parking has been moved. The square footage of the house has been reduced. It now stands at 78 square metres of the permitted 93, smaller than the minimum size set out for healthy living in the national space standards, and a bit smaller than any houses in Bossington. It would be tragic if young families like them, who are the future, were to find themselves driven away. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Carew. And um, Mrs. Harriet Carew is the next speaker. Thank you, Mrs. Carew. You would take a seat and you will have two minutes from when you start to speak. Can I just point out to members of the public that the Chairman's discretion is that you bring your remarks to a conclusion uh, as quickly as possible after the two minutes have sounded. If anybody goes past two minutes twenty, I will ask them to draw their remarks to an immediate conclusion. Thank you, Mrs. Carew. Over two and a half years ago, my husband and I purchased Hellstone Bungalow whilst we were renting in Porlock Weir. Our ambition was, and still is, to live there as a family with our daughter and our second baby, who is arriving very soon. Romantic it may seem, but what we love about this site is its off-grid location and its opportunity to live harmoniously with nature in a sustainable way. Like the residents of Bossington, we know and understand how special this site is and we do not want to change or alter the experience of our neighbours or the past users. I am from Somerset, and my husband is from Exmoor. Our friends and family are on Exmoor, and we want to make the bungalow our home. Surely, as a young family wanting to live on Exmoor in an environmentally friendly way, we should be encouraged and helped in this, rather than pushed out, as shown by the Exmoor Young Voices support. The last two and a half years have been truly awful and has caused considerable worry and strain. It is a terrible thing to feel ostracised from a community we want to make our home over a planning application. We have received anonymous hate mail through the letterbox, a wall of placards placed by our house, assertions that bribes have been made between us and the planning authority, and incorrect speculations about our supposed wealth. Even some absurd assertions that we will steal stones from Bossington Beach and that will litter and, and abuse the beautiful place. Comments like this can be found on the Paulock Facebook group, which has over 5,000 members. It feels like there has been a sustained attack on our character and reputation. It is unpleasant and unnecessary 
when all we want to do is rebuild a timber bungalow. Despite having had to endure considerable public abuse during this painful planning application, we are not the kind of people to hold grudges. We are good people wanting to replace a dilapidated bungalow with a very similar sustainable bungalow. We are not developers looking to build hundreds of houses on a green job site, and we absolutely do not deserve to be treated in this way. I'd like to thank the members of the committee for taking the time to consider our plan. Thank you very much, Mrs Carew. And our final speaker is the applicant, uh, Mr Ivo Carew. Uh, Mr Carew, you'll have five minutes from when you start to speak. In 2021, my wife Harris and I submitted a pre-planning application to replace the sadly dilapidated Hullstone bungalow with a timber bungalow with a similar design. The then head of planning, Kieran Reeves, supported the proposal and stated that a replacement dwelling of up to 93 square metres would be within equitable planning policy. Later that year, we submitted a planning application for a replacement timber bu uh, building of 93 square metres. Sir Worthy and Minehead Parish Council unanimously supported the application, as did a lot of local people. Following some local objection, we reduced the size of the building numerous times and revised the layout of the parking five times. All four of our previous planning officers supported the proposal, namely Kieran Reeves, Tim Firmage, Andrew Spears and Dean Kinsella. All four of the previous planning officers confirmed the proposal was within planning policy. The scrutiny and level of detail this application has had to go into is unprecedented for an application of this size. We have had to undertake a plethora of specialist reports, including ecology reports, bat reports, badger reports, flood reports, traffic management plans, construction method statements, landscape appraisals, environment <coughs> management plans, and many, many more. Fundamentally, the parks were, and still are, supportive of the principle of a replacement dwelling. As you will know, the application was heard to be, uh, scheduled to be heard at the October committee meeting last year. This current planning application was then fully supported by the parks who stated it was within planning policy. The application was pulled two hours before the meeting because of concern that the National Par uh, Parks Planning Report was not sufficiently detailed. Latterly, Dean Kinsella supported we amend the parking layout and provide more information on the lay-by we intend to use for construction vehicles. This information was provided and we were under the assumption that the planning verdict would remain the same in the following committee meeting. We understand that two issues have since been raised. The first issue is of pollution, uh, sorry, light pollution. We are ourselves staunchly against any form of light pollution on Exmoor and have as such proposed no external lighting whatsoever. Since this issue of light spill was raised in January this year, we have reduced the size of the proposed windows. Should further measures be required by the committee, we would, of course, accept a planning condition as suggested by the park's ecologist for low transmission glass or, indeed, automated blackout lines. The second point, which has been raised, surrounds the size of the bungalow. Many of the objections highlight the fact that the proposed bungalow is longer. Bungalow is proposed to be longer, but it is also proposed to be narrower. This, in my view, is more important as it allows the building to be set back from the coastal path and would be less visible. The concern the proposal is taller is also an incomplete argument. The roof has to increase by a minimum of 1.6 metres in order to allow for traditional tiles to be used instead of the current asbestos roof tiles. It has to be at a minimum pitch of 35 degrees according to building regulations. The internal floor area of the bungalow is currently 66 square metres. 
we are proposing to increase this by 12 square metres. We understand that an increase of 35% is typically allowed on Exmoor. Our increase is only 18%, about the size of a box bedroom. This is clearly not the vast overdevelopment which has been touted. The assertion that the planning application is an overdevelopment is factually incorrect. If you look at the total built area, including the existing and replacement shed, the proposal is in fact smaller by 26 square metres. This is not an application for a modern concrete monstrosity. The new building will have a pitch roof and is arguably more traditional than the existing building. It will incorporate a reclaimed tile roof instead of asbestos, timber slash windows, etc. etc. The bungalow is sadly beyond repair, and having spent two and a half years ironing out the details, we strongly believe this is the right proposal for its replacement. 12 square metres. A box bedroom is small. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Carew. <coughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings to an end the public speaking part of uh, this item. So we move to the member debate. Unless there's anything we want to deal with, Mr. White, and from the public speaking. Right, members. Who would like to begin? Yes, of course, Mr. Cravis. Thank you, Chair. I mean, it's more of a question than part of the debate on the report, because I remember back in the site, at the site meeting in the previous, the previous one about the debate about the lawful use, etc., etc., and then reading through. And so from a lawful, from a lawful use point of view, if, I don't know, hypothetically, they don't get, you know, planning permission wasn't granted and um, they give up and I suddenly find myself, you know, I get home one day and my other half says it's not, decided it's not worth the aggravation and I'm suddenly looking for somewhere to live. <coughs> And um, I decide to say hypothetically rent this bungalow, which is lawful use. Um, obviously, I've got yeah, your car too. Um, not necessarily very environmentally friendly cars either. Um, I've got two dogs that have got a habit of eating anything that moves if they're given half the chance. What would would that be? And this is what I'm trying to get my head around because there was a very long, very long bit here about the lawful use. Um, would there be anything stopping that? and say, if I might be slightly addicted to those LED lights you get that, you know, are solar powered and light up and make your fence look pretty, would there be anything lawfully stopping me from a planning reason from doing that? That's right. Tim, um, uh, short answer is no. I mean, it is a, it is a the lawful use of the site is a residential use, so someone could, could occupy that tomorrow as a dwelling. Um, just to add a little bit of balance, we probably need to be a little bit careful about over-egging like, the likelihood of sticking out loads of LED lights and what have you, because it's all about what is the likelihood. But nonetheless, yes, someone, a family, an individual could occupy that property as a single residential planning unit. Thank you. Mr. Olson. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you also to all the speakers earlier and for taking the trouble and getting engaged. Uh, in, this, in this application, that's, um, that's good to see and I hope whatever the outcome is, I hope that the community can find a way to uh, repair whatever has happened in the past and people can come together over this. But um, it's a couple of things strike me. One is the difference between the application in October and the one we have before us now. The one in October was recommended for approval. This one is recommended for refusal and that frankly has not been well explained as to why that has happened. Um, furthermore, I find the reasons that have been given in here for the refusal and the way that it is argued is not as strong as it could be. Um, and I find in places there is, it goes into some subjective remarks um, regarding around the way that this would be highly intrusive or whatever the words are, are, are used. Um, some very negative language around the way the thing is described and I worry and maybe this is our discussion now will be how we ensure that we're making a robust decision because otherwise I think this could uh, frankly go to appeal um, the, 
other issue is, is trying to, which I think some speakers have, have tried to get to, is this idea of the baseline. Too often, and I'm sorry to say in the report, this is almost discussed as if this was a new build. It is not. It is a replacement of an existing building. Therefore, the differences, even when we come to things like light pollution, should be expressed in terms of the marginal difference between an existing property and even possibly a notional exact replica of the existing property. But it, it's too hard to see now with that photo of a rather dilapidated building, which has probably been in darkness for quite a long time. And if we imagine that actually was rebuilt absolutely as it is now, but with all the windows not boarded up with plywood, but with lights you know, coming through them, what would be basically the difference? We're not talking about a difference from a completely dark and peaceful area with nothing happening to suddenly a place that is filled with light. We're talking about a marginal increase. What is the difference between what our baseline could be and what this different property would be? That is not argued here in these papers. It's just simply put across that for some reason this would be a light pollution problem. We, in the policies that are referred to, for instance, when we get to um, HCD 17 on replacement dwellings, our policy and plan allows for replacement dwelling, as has been discussed, to be increased up to 93 square metres. This one doesn't even do that, but let's say it did. But we also talk about it reflecting the massing and scale of the existing building. Now, that's a little bit of a contradiction in there, because if something is bigger, what do we mean by reflect the massing and scale? Um, and I think that allows us to be honest, a certain amount of latitude there in terms of some flexibility of what would be a reasonable way of interpreting that. And one of those ways would be to sort of say, for instance, the pitch of the roof has to change because if you build the roof in that particular way at the moment and the kind of rainfall we have here in Exmoor, you're going to have water coming through. Having a steeper pitch roof is actually much more sensible. It uh, complies with building regulations. That seems to be reasonable and seems to comply with our existing policy. So I, looking at this, I'm, I find myself, and I've made a lot of different, different notes here, and I'm sorry if I'm uh, going backwards and forwards, uh, and hopefully we'll have a chance to, to come back to this, but I feel that what we're looking at here, in term, and particularly the fact we've quoted here as one of the reasons for refusing it as GP1 and the purposes, is, and then you look at the photo again of the existing building, and you look at what is now proposed, to argue that, I mean, to argue that we're not improving on that, I find, and therefore enhancing the National Park, I do, again, I find difficult, I haven't, this is a finely balanced decision, and I, ha I haven't myself, um, could, I'm interested to hear what other, uh, other members are going to say, but what I am again returning to is I do not find here argued well or reasons given as to why we are expected to think that the new build will not be an enhancement of what is currently there on this site. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Olson. Uh, the next speaker I have is Mr. Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Joe, thank you much. I think it's a very good report and, and, and does scrutinise more than the previous reports. As we've already heard, the scrutiny has gone through. So I think it's an improvement on the October report which missed out some objections, and that's why there's a difference, quite a little difference. I was very concerned about that report, and uh, in fact, at one o'clock at night, trying to think, reconcile why it was being recommended when I'd read so many letters against. So this report seems much more in line with what I see when I read all the details. Um, I went on the site visit as well, and I had lots of questions. I think Dean was probably fed up with my questions because I. I live local to this area, my adjoining parish. I know the footpath, I've cycled it, I've walked it, I've ridden horses down there. It's actually kind of so another point, riding horse past that when it's been built, it can be quite a challenge. Um, so, yes, going back to the scheme, um, it does provide the positive side, it, it has housing stock, and it would be good quality housing stock, um, low carbon. And therefore, and also the report says, possibly some benefit to planting. And it's using the Derrick building, as you're saying, Dominic. So that's the positives. But, and young, young voices mention this, it's not a self-build. It's not a low-cost project, <coughs> nor is it housing that can be preserved for local people or prime residents. So the benefit to the housing stock is, is sort of questionable there. Um, but as Joe 
report goes on, I agree that Bowser would lead to significant harm to the character and appearance, and there's insufficient evidence to rule out harm to protected species, the bats, there's a lot of talk in the bats there about that. Um, and the scheme does conflict with the local plan in many areas, which I think the report does set out where it does conflict. So in my report, there's a limited benefit to housing stock. Um, I, I do agree it's, it's an improvement on that in some ways, but it doesn't have to be the size it is, of mass and scale. And the, 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 the issue about the pitch of roof, I googled very quickly. I, I, I'm not sure I'd go along with that has to be the pitch. There are other ways of achieving a lower building, which is currently is suggested 1.8 metres high. That's my height. <coughs> I'm just under 1.8. Um, that's a big increase. So I, I don't know if I'd go along with the argument that the building is required to be that high. I'm sure there's ways around that, but that's just from my uh, initial thoughts. The, so there is that balance being seen with providing the positive, but the negative and the impact and the harm seems to be quite great. And the report, I think, balances that quite well. And that's why I think there are so many people, thank you much for coming along, locally against this, the National Trust, uh, the Exeter Society, the Exmoor uh, History Society, and we've heard the uh, CPRE, <coughs> and we've also heard the South Coast of Footpath Association. These are all bodies which care about the air and have committed. And I thought it's 62 households. We're now hearing it's more than a household have written in, raised, I think, very sensible objections. So um, one which comes up, and Dominic, you referred to about replacement dwellings, and there is obviously that the policy is there. And the report says, and I, I agree, that, and many people have raised this point, um, it, is, it isn't of similar scale or massing to the original dwelling. And you, you look at it, and we, when you look at the comparisons, when you're on site and you map it out, and the elongation is, is I accept there's a balance about keeping away from the post of footpath, but we end up being a very long development. Now, whether the figure of 126 metres is correct, I don't know, but if, if it's anywhere like that, I guess the time you add the, the building and the garage, that's quite an elongation. So I think that the, the scale and mass and the impact on the environment is quite considerable. So there has been a landscape um, viability appraisal done, um, but as the report sets out, the officers aren't convinced that that will make a big impact. And that the, and the development will be very visible from the coast of Footpath and Bosington Beach, um, and more so actually at night when the, the extra glazing space, which is obviously design consideration to have larger windows, um, will make it more more dominant at night, and and the nature of the, sort of the location of the building, um, it's, it's a very natural, tranquil area, and that's going to be disturbed by the lighting and the generator as well, which I picked up on the fact I have solar panels in that area, and it, in the winter you don't get much electricity produced, so the generator running off fuel or whatever will also interrupt the tranquility. Um, I also have some other concerns which aren't necessarily directly planning, but I'm a professional civil engineer, I've done risk assessments, I've done construction statements. What I've seen so far, I don't see a valid risk assessment in terms of building alongside a bridle path. I just don't see how that can be done unless that bridle path is diverted, which then, in my mind, becomes a planning issue. Um, the construction method statement, which I, I say as a professional, I've produced many, hasn't been signed up by a professional body. I don't think that's quite right. And I think if it were to go ahead, that needs clearly can be addressed, but that needs addressing to understand how it can be built safely. And um, material, which is currently being proposed, shipped from a lay-by four or five miles away. So I think that all needs looking at. But coming back to the planning issues, um, <coughs> no, I support the, policy, uh, the recommendation that we do uh, refuse it. Right, thank you, Mr. Gray. Dr. Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Um, similar to a few of us, I had the benefit of a site inspection that was extremely useful and I had the opportunity to listen to a number of views that were put forward and again today. So I appreciate uh, people's time to put forward their views. It's interesting listening to that. There are some discrepancies, for example, in the way 
uh, the floor areas are being presented, depending on which view you are putting forward, but I don't want to go into that particular detail. Um, the situation, as I see it, is actually fairly clear-cut, because with the benefit of the site visit and with the benefit of listening to what's being said today, setting aside some of the discrepancies in respect of some of the measurements, there are discrepancies and inconsistencies, uh, it seems very clear to me uh, that a decision has to be made on the application today that is before us, not the application that was presented some time ago, but what is before you today, taking into account the policies and also the consultation responses. And it's very clear when we arrive at decisions, as you know, that these must be evidence-based. Now, I don't see that as being a particularly subjective exercise at all, with due respect. We are going to experts in their particular fields. They are employed, they are professionally employed and experienced in looking at these issues. And if we look at the consultation responses, it seems to me that the officer report is very well reasoned. It takes into account all these views in an independent and objective manner, as we would expect, and then exercises the planning balance in arriving at a fully informed decision. And I would second the recommendation that we refuse the application for the reasons listed. I don't consider these to be other than evidence-based. They are evidence-based. And yes, there is an exercise. You could take it to appeal. But at the end of the day, I think all the issues have been thoroughly explored. Some of the I'm not personally convinced, but I'm setting this aside as to what that the existing dwelling has not been abandoned. For example, we heard that it had been lived in up to 2006. The applicants had acquired it two and a half years ago. I'm not absolutely clear what happened in between, but I'm setting that particular issue aside. On the merits of the application before us, as of today, I think the officer's recommendation is well reasoned and I will support the recommendation of refusal. Thank you. Just to be absolutely clear, because you mentioned seconding uh, the recommendation, I don't know that Mr. Bray actually moved anything. Sorry? However, if Mr. Bray was intending to move refusal in accordance with the recommendation, I think Dr. Kelly was in the process of seconding it. I'm happy to, yes, sorry. Thank you. All right. Okay, so if it can be noted. Right, moving on, members. Mrs. Nicholson. I have not come to a conclusion yet as to which way I shall vote. However, I, I, the things I want to say are um, officers accept that the use has not ceased, so there's a dwelling there, which could be lived in with difficulty and could be replaced. There is, everybody accepts a legal right of access and I take exception to organisations which say they accept there may be a legal right but they really don't want it exercised. I don't think that's an appropriate and proper way to behave. <coughs> the question, the only question for me is the size, the shape, the wildlife questions, and that's where I'm not yet decided. Thank you. Um, before I bring any more members in, I'm just going to ask Mr. Weiss if uh, there are any comments you want to make on what you've heard so far. No? Right. <coughs> Mrs. Chilcott. Um, thank you. Perhaps you can help and assist me. I've, I've heard and read that previously the plans that before us were sort of approved and there's been an extensive pre-planning advice. I'm trying to get clear in, in my mind why it's changed from one to the other and that's a bit I'm not totally clear on. So I would find that helpful because you know, I know we help and support planning applications and it's just a slight niggle with me if we've been saying yes, 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 no. <coughs> so if you could help with that, I would appreciate it. Mr White. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, yeah, so um, the, the previous application, obviously the previous application, that was withdrawn. So there's, the, if you like, there's not a recommendation from officers in that situation. I mean, the officers will be speaking with the applicant, but in terms of a, a formal determination, 
the authority hasn't come to a view on that. So in terms of any sort of weight to be attached to that, it's, it's pretty limited. Um, this current application, as I reflected in the report, obviously came to a committee in October last year. That was with recommendation to approve at that point. It got deferred. Um, the applicant had discussions with the then head of planning as well and made some further changes in line with those discussions. The, 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 the situation ultimately, <coughs> the authority still hasn't made a determination on the application. So there's been no resolution, if you like, to permit or any planning commission in place. It is nonetheless, it's something that's there, okay, something that, that I'm mindful of in writing that report. But I'm also mindful of the consultation responses that are there. I'm mindful of the changes, not only to reduce the scale of the building, but also to reflect, if you like, the, the scale of the existing building. And then, you know, as officers, we have to come to a view. That's where that analysis within the port report comes from. You know, this, there, is two, there is two key issues. One, you know, the reason for, first reason for you that relates to character and appearance. Now, ultimately, there's an element of plain judgment. You know, we have to exercise a, a judgment around whether we think that's acceptable or not. I would argue the report acknowledges the existing building there and considers that within its assessment. And we can, you know, within that, we can use tools about, okay, differences in size and what have you to help us come to a view as to whether we judge that to be acceptable or not. Um, and that's, in essence, where we've, we've got to with this application. You know, things have changed in the interim, and officers have to come to a view ultimately when we're then presenting the application back to the committee. Right. Thank you. Right. Um, I don't see any new speakers coming forward. Oh, no, I want to yeah. Mr. Craig, yeah, would you like to be, uh, say something further to... Well, my, my previous previous was just a question Indeed. for clarification, and as I said, um, it, it was a good report. I don't know if I want to give the impression that it wasn't, because I actually yeah read it and it kept me, yeah. You know, and I read it, and I, the issue I had, I suppose, with it was well, not an issue with the report. I read it, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> and then you get to the end, and it says we recommend refusal because of the other bits. And I was struggling for me, and I suppose this is where Dr. Kelly was going from. Uh, the, the, oh, you, um, Dominic was coming from was it was very subjective and I think you just said that and actually this boils down to if we've got lawful use we've got, you, it boils down to do we think and this goes back to GP1 I think do we, do we think that actually what is being proposed would actually be of benefit on, the, on I think the enhancing the area I think was the main yeah, all those reasons for refusal. I mean, I think we've got, excuse me if I'm fumbling a bit, but we've got seascape, um, night sky, landscape, accessory rights of way, replacement dwelling. I'm very confused on the size differences between this, but um, whether it's 12 metres small or 128 metres long. Um, and what, in 100 years' time, and I think this was said by one of the speakers was, in a hundred years' time, will people be thinking, who on earth let that happen? Or will in a hundred years' time, people will think, oh, look at that. And it's where we go with that. And I must admit, I am undecided, a um, bit, like, bit like Francis, um, of which way to go. But I'm curious, I suppose, I'm curious about the bits of that sustainable development and I'm a bit confused, I'm not confused with MPPTs and sustainable development and allowing sustainable development and those are climate change policies, etc. Actually, there's an opportunity here to create something a little bit special and I get slightly concerned, and this is maybe on a personal level, when yeah, we start worrying about what people walking footpaths that go the whole of the southwest of England think of something in our patch. Um, you know, the England the English coast path goes through goes through my driveway, um, much to my incredulous incredulous incredulous. And I would be very upset if they suddenly started commenting on a planning application um, that I was putting in. Or my kids would have to probably get in the queue, I suppose. Um, but with regard to that, so that's where I'm I'm slightly uncomfortable at the view of the people who are going to walk past something for possibly a minute and a half, maybe three minutes, at the same time, I'm very conscious that there's a lot of people, local people here from Bossington and Alfred and so where you probably see it an awful lot and probably know it better. And I probably 
and, and probably even grown to love that. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I do love it or not. Um, and it's whether the decision of what is being proposed, and as Mike says, the application that is in front of us, ticks those boxes that would allow it, or whether the weighting of it goes to what the reasons for refusals. Um, and I do worry, and I'm probably going over time, I do worry about the night sky, because I do think that um, Dominic probably thought that a lot more eloquently than me, that um, you know, it's not total darkness there. I worry about the seascape because it's actually quite a distance away from the sea. Um, and I know, you know, you can just about see the sea from there. And then the landscape. The landscape from where? Um, the landscape as you walk past it. The landscape from the sea. The landscape from around the corner when you don't see it. Is it the overall image of um, Exmoor to tourists? And actually, should we, you know, we need an opportunity and an interest in an Exmoor family. Um, now, Somerset family, are we going to let that affect the quality of the, the quality of the buildings that people can live in um, and bring up a family in? And that's, yeah, that's who I am. And I still will probably be making up my mind on which way I'm going, frantically reading these papers. And when you call for a vote, Jeff, yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you. Um, to um not decided yet which way I'm, I'm going to vote. I think because this is an existing property that is being replaced, from that point of view, uh, I think it's a, a good idea. It's a, it's a young family that wants to remain in this area. They are from this area. I think that is, uh, that is a positive. I am uh, slightly confused about the increase in the sizes because if it is just the size of a small box room that's being added on, I, I, I kind of can't see what that, that issue is. Um, I think from the fact that Marcus has raised also the seascape, the landscape and, and all those issues that he's raised I actually, and I wasn't intending to say send one of the officers out in a boat to get a picture from out at sea however it does look a long way so I, I'm not quite sure what it's going to spoil from the beach or from, from being out at sea or the edge of the sea it's hardly going to be a lighthouse so I, I just I am struggling with this one very much so from obviously the point of view put forward by, by our officers but I, 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 I am erring towards going against the officer's recommendation however I, I think I need a little bit more maybe convincing to go the other, the other way. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, Mr Thwaites. Thank you Chairman. Uh, I suppose my concern is, or it seems to be, is that the previous application, I appreciate it didn't go through committee and everything, was recommendation that we approve it. Um, and now, after all that process, it's like pre-planning advice, which we encourage them to go forward. We have this application, which is put forward to refuse. I'd like to understand what was the change that made so much difference, that when from one application we decided that we were going to recommend approval and so the second application we're going to recommend rejection Chairman, just, just to make a couple of points I guess it's just from an officer's point of view uh, and in terms of I guess factors to consider I would encourage members or advise against putting too much weight on the fact that, you know, about the, a local family simply because there's nothing within the application which <laughs> would secure that. You know, we're dealing with a planning application to go on a site, not with a planning application to go to <laughs> a particular individual. Equally, with regard to the previous report, I mean, I've, 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 I've covered that, but I think it's also important to, to point out that that report, in essence, got deferred at committee before and because of, you know, there was comments about actually it needs to be more thorough yeah. or what have you, and that's, that, that then resulted in the report before us. But the committee is free come to the decision it wishes to based on the merits of the scheme as I say they're set out in the report for you we have also had this element of different figures bound about haven't we and it, you know, it depends on which bits you measure and which, which, bit, which figures suit I guess I just want to come back to this slide here because <coughs> ultimately this is probably you know, the, the most sort of impactful elevation Okay, this is that elevation towards the coast path 
out with wider with, with wider views. That's the one that's going to be most apparent. And again, you know, it is a judgment, okay, but we can see a comparison between the two. The principles officers say in the report <coughs> is acceptable. We accept that you can replace a building, but it's a sensitive site, okay. It's sensitive because of remoteness. It's sensitive because of the lack of built form around it, okay. So in that regard, it, it's being very careful about how we judge the impact of new development. You know, the sensitivity are quite significant. The design of the building itself, if you take it off this site and put it somewhere else, officers aren't particularly critical of it. It simply comes down to a matter of that will increase in scale mass on that site. It would also become more apparent, I think, to, to anybody sort of within that area, not only in terms of using the, 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 the right of way, but also the element of potential for increased light flow. Yes, the existing building has windows. The issue here was going to end up with more when there's more potential for light flow. But that's an element of its impact, okay? It's not solely about light spill. It's about the combination of factors which officers feel leads to harm to what ultimately is a natural and tranquil setting. That's where the position we've reached as officers. Added to that, relating to light spill, is the potential. We, we, we are concerned, we don't think there's sufficient evidence to nicely be able to robustly say this proposal won't cause harm to commuting and foraging back because of potential light spill. That, in fairness, is probably a lesser issue. It's an issue nonetheless. It's an important issue. It's still a key issue. I say it's a lesser issue because I think there's potential for us to work through that. But the circumstances they are, this is a scheme we have. This is what we're asked to determine. That's what officers have done. That's where the report is before you. But the report clearly focuses on those key material planning issues but it does, and the other matters, and planning balance, acknowledge those other factors which come into the mix before it reaches that recommendation. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Um, our next speaker, and I'm still calling first-time speakers, uh, is uh, Mr. Petrinos. Thanks. Um, thanks, Chair. Gosh, how interesting. I mean, I've been listening carefully, and it's been, it's been great to hear such a a range and diversity of, of, of opinion, um, not least from the, from the, the public. Um, and I can understand that this, this is a very sensitive site and that, nevertheless, it's a finely balanced judgment um, that we're here to kind of decide based on what we've heard and read and seen. But at the moment, I'm minded subject to, as you might hear in the future, to um, go against the officer recommendation, which I don't normally do, I don't know, um, and, and support the um, the application subject to the appropriate conditions being made, perhaps including those on light pollution. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Petrinos. Um, Mr. Yabsley. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, what, a, what an interesting application, my goodness me. I'm struggling. Okay. I am struggling with it. <coughs> it's, great. It's, a, it's a great report, but I sense it's swinging from one side to the other as you read it, quite rightly. But there is one premise there that we have accepted, and that uh, this site has residential permission. Uh, if that wasn't there, I think we wouldn't be having this discussion. But it is there, isn't it? So to be completely fair, and reading the application report with or the officer report with that baseline, I am struggling, struggling to decide which side it comes down on in the end. <coughs> I, have a, I have some concerns about the design. Can I not be dug back into the hill to get it away from the footpath? I'm also concerned that we're suggesting that the, the normal extension allow would not be allowed. Uh, people are going to live in it. They've got to have enough room, haven't they? So if you see where I'm coming, I, I'm still not sure which way I'm going. And I might even second Councillor Petrinos's application or proposal. You didn't, didn't make a proposal. You're going to make a proposal. Oh, was it? <laughs> Thank you. Are there any new speakers? Mr. Milton. 
Yeah, just just quite briefly, really, quite challenging thoughts, really. I think I think following on from Mr. Petrinus's comments, really, yes, we've got to bear in mind that the, the established right is there, and I think so. From my mind, the decision has got to be made purely around those policies that we have around whether the the mass of this building and the appearance is suitable for the site that it's on, unacceptable, and that we, whether we can deal with or mitigate the effects of any light pollution and impacts. And I think that's the really difficult one. And it's, as Mr. White said at the beginning, it's a very finely balanced decision to determine whether or not that feels appropriate or within our policies. Thank you. And in that case, Ms. Davis. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm very mindful that I have sat on this committee for 19 years. Um, clearly, I was very young when I started. Uh, the mere embryo. <laughs> <laughs> but even with 19 years of sitting here, that does not make me a professional planning officer. We've had our professional planning officers looked at this and done a very comprehensive report, uh, as indeed the officers before him, and a retired professional planning officer has spoken very eloquently. It is very finely balanced. My opinion is irrelevant. I'm about material planning considerations and therefore I will be voting with the officer recommendation on this matter. Thank you very much. So I'm now going to ask Mr. Elson to come back and then Mr. Bray and then we will put the matter to the vote. Mr. Thank Elson. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> yes, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to criticise an officer's report and I, and, I, and I want to be careful in the way that I'm wording this. But equally, and I take what the chairman has said about the importance of us listening to professional uh, uh, planning uh, officers and retired planning officers but nonetheless we do this through a planning committee and many of us bring different skills here. Mr Bray has brought civil engineering skills and many of the other speakers today have also brought different skills and perspectives and I think all of those have um, value as well. And I, I want to, the reason I was mentioning the report about uh, is because of, it's easy to wave away the October report which we're invited to do as if that is no longer relevant but it is a fact. It is publicly available. It is on our website. You can read it. My recollection of why that was then deferred at the time was to actually look into issues of access, land use, and a few other things like car parking, National Trust. Um, those things have not turned out to be material in this new report, as far as I can see. This report makes a lot of this issue of the fact this new dwelling would result in a visually jarring intrusion of conspicuous built form within the countryside setting. And, and I think I'm right in saying that probably reflects a lot of what the public have said here today as well. And that's a completely, that's a very important aspect to take into account, um, is what we mean by that jarring, well, those are the words used, a jarring intrusion. You know, that word jarring, it's not just an intrusion, it's a jarring intrusion. And it's going to be different what many of us would consider to be jarring or not. But we must also come back to the idea that we would allow, which we've already accepted, the existing dwelling is habitable. It wouldn't be comfortable, but it's habitable. You can have access to it, you can drive your fossil fuel vehicle to it, you can park up and you can live in this building. You could also take this building and we would allow under our policy to build an extension to that building to increase its size by 33% or 30% whatever the word is. Um, which of course, if you were to just pop that onto the side, that would actually make it not far off the proposed building. Um, and would we now be saying we're going to set a higher bar for those sort of extensions? Are we also saying that for replacement dwellings, we're going to set a higher bar? We say here, within the predominantly natural and undeveloped setting of this remote site, it's not undeveloped. It's got a house in it. It looks natural partly because it's been a, not lived in for a while and there's a lot of undergrowth around it. So that photo we saw earlier, even if you rebuilt this building, as I said earlier, as an exact <coughs> replica of the existing one, but tidied the site up, made it more habitable, landscaped the garden, 
you will immediately change the setting. And you might argue that to do so would make it visually jarring. The trouble, because it's right next to the coastal path. But of course, the coastal path has many other houses that are right up against it. This is not unique. So I'm as sorry to say that I still do not understand why we're invited to think that this is particularly visually jarring or why, in this sense, we're setting a higher bar for replacement dwelling <coughs> when we could have written a report that actually would, would, would support certain policies. We could say, for instance, under GP1, that this is an efficient use of land, building, services, and infrastructure because we're doing a rebuild on an existing site, which is preferable to doing a new build in a new site. It's also using sustainable building techniques. Again, that is absolutely in line with our policy. You could make a case that actually this application uh, complies with many of our policies and enhances the National Park. Um, we've chosen, however, to see this as a visually jarring intrusion. So I would like to propose, actually, that we uh, do not accept the officer's recommendation and that we approve this application. I can't take that as an amendment because it's direct negative. We'll put the motion as it's currently being made. Yes. If it falls, yes. then we'll re-examine the situation. That's what I knew you would say, but I wanted to have you say it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased to have given you that pleasure. Uh, Mr. Crow, this did, what, yeah, is this a question? Because I have to come back to Mr. Bray. If, if the motion falls, and you say we'll re-examine it, because of course then if we wanted to remind it, if it was then minded to put conditions on any passing of this application, that's when we'd discuss that, wouldn't we? Thank you. You've got it in one. Mr. Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just coming back to a couple of points. Mark, I think you were saying that the coastal footpath goes past your house. I, I don't exactly know where you live. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> this location is very special. It, it, and, and you don't, people aren't walking. And yours, pleasure. Probably very special. <laughs> but people walk on this footpath because it is special. It's not just a coastal footpath. People, I go there. People go there to, because of tranquility. It, it is a special part of the footpath. And that's why people walk past it. And someone talked about the, sending the officers out to look back. We actually have got photographs um, of that view from the previous report. Um, yeah, but that's not on this report. No, no, I realise that. No, but in terms of the officers appreciating the impact and being able to appreciate impact. So the seascape impact it will be very clear to the officers. And it, say, it's not just this, uh, any other footpath. Um, it does impact the tranquility of that area. It is a very special area. Um, and people are going there because of that. And I do accept, I think something should be developed there. And when you go there and you see, the, you're already looking up, and then you add 1.8 metres, the visual impact is, is great because the current dwelling lends in, partly because it's overgrown, um, <laughs> partly because it's overblown, <laughs> but it could be a, a dwelling, if, if it was an extension built for the existing dwelling, it would be less jarring than this proposal. Um, but there would be ways, I think, of doing something in keeping more low cost. Um, of achieving something. So I've, I've heard people say that. I think it would be right to have something there, but something more in keeping. Going back to Nick, you, you raised the point about what's the difference in the previous report. I think Joe's been put in an awkward situation to answer that question. I've got it here, and you go back, and there are gaps in it. There says that no one had commented from the southwest coast of Footpath. Oh, they, they had. So no, we've been commenting about comparison of the reports. <coughs> There were gaps in the previous report, um, and even at a site visit, I think there were gaps in understanding of the new development when the question was asked. Um, and that's going to be quite hard for Joe to cover. Um, so I can see why different conclusions have been reached. M Mr. Thwaites, did you want to come back very quickly? Yes, just 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 clarify. So let, let's assume, or let, let's if the proposal that's put forward is rejected um, or so therefore the people that own this property can therefore develop the existing premise which means it will be jarring once they do so it will have lights and it will stand out so I suppose what I'm really saying is that you have to decide on I hate to say it, the worst of the best of the two evils if you don't do anything and this is failed this is this permission is not given it could be developed as it exists. 
and it could be jarring anything that comes from it or you could come forward and actually approve something which is the best you can get so I think we have to be very careful here because if we're not careful we're going to set ourselves up for a worse situation than we already have Thank you Mr Bush. I'm going to ask um, Mr White possibly to comment on that and to um, uh, just uh, put any final points forward before we take the vote. Mr White. Thanks Chairman. Um, I, I just want to be really clear that the report does accept that the existing house on the site okay, it accepts that it could be occupied tomorrow and have the impacts associated with that. Okay, So it's not a case of necessarily as it is now, it's, it's on the basis of if there's a residential land use on there. I'm slightly concerned that we might consider it on the basis well, we can end up with something worse. We won't end up with something worse because if it's worse, it can't be acceptable. Okay? An alternative has to be acceptable. The potential for extension is a really difficult one to go down because we don't have that before us. Okay? We're asked to determine what's in front of us and what is in front of us is what we've seen. Okay? There may be a potential for an extension, again, but it's very difficult to go down there because we don't know what that is. We're not asked to judge that. We're asked to make a judgment on the merits of the scheme as presented, and that is the site as we see it against the proposed scheme. The other element I wanted to, I, I guess, cl be clear on is that the report naturally concludes where the scheme is acceptable. That's a balanced report. Okay, there are elements of the proposal which the report acknowledges which are okay. Indeed, the fact that there's anything dwelling there means on some of the key considerations set out, officers don't find harm, for example, flood risk, for example, access, okay? It comes back, again, as I say, to those issues of character and appearance. Is the proposed development acceptable against the site as we see it on the ground now? And that's ultimately where, as I say, the report uh, assesses it. Thank you, Mr. White. Right, so just to remind members that at the moment we have a proposal by Mr. Bray, seconded by Dr. Kelly, that the officer's recommendation of approval should... Uh, refusal. The officer's recommendation of refu refusal should be uh, the one that we uh, accept this afternoon. So may I see all those, please, in favour of that motion for refusal. All those against? And any abstentions? Could you put your hands up again? Three, three. It was three. Robin. Robin. Robin was right. In that case, ladies and gentlemen, that motion is lost. So uh, to refer to, return to uh, Mr. Elson's point. Uh, we now have the opportunity to put forward a different proposal. Would you like to do so, Mr. Olson? Yes, I'd like to propose that we uh, approve this application. Um, the conditions, I just want to raise one little point in the report where we talk about conditions which we have used in the past, which is regarding screening, uh, natural planting. We have other applications where that does happen. Uh, this report implies that those are pointless because things can die back and not be replenished. Uh, I think we need to be clear that um, actually using plantings, I think I'm right in saying, is part of the sort of tools at our disposal, and therefore maybe we shouldn't diminish that in a report. Um, and so it could be we regard that here as an example. We've already heard from the applicants that their willingness in order to engage with things like plantings and perhaps uh, no external lighting, of course, and perhaps even some conditions on the sort of glazing that's used, and I think all of those would be worth considering beyond my competence to suggest what those conditions are. So I would just like to propose the motion and maybe the officers can recommend the conditions. Do you have any policy reasons for why we should be accepting this oh, yes, proposal? Um, so my policy reasons are under, under GP1, I see this is furthering the purposes of the park. It's an efficient use of land buildings um, and it is using sustainable building uh, techniques. It, it complies with HC D17 for replacement um, dwellings uh, because it uh, complies with the rule regarding the 93 uh, square metres. In fact, it is uh, well within that. Um, and the landscape setting uh, of Exmoor settlements, but of course it is therefore um, retaining a settlement uh, within an existing uh, hamlet of other settlements, so I believe it complies with CES1. 
Thank you. Would anybody like to second it by Mr. Trinos? Anybody else wish to speak to that? Mr. White. Do you say anything about that? Um, I don't think I do, Chair. Thank you. So it's been moved by uh, Mr. Elson and seconded by Mr. Petrinos that this should be approved. The officer has taken note of policy reasons uh, that you have put forward and um, also also the um, conditions. Um, I suspect that there will be other conditions that will need to be added um, and I would suggest that we uh, leave it to officers to add those further conditions. Are members happy to do that? Yes, Mr. White? Just a point of clarification. Is the conditions then run past with the chair of the committee as well? Or is it just left company to officers? Or can we put it to you to, to, to support that? You can, you can do that if you wish to. I but can like I to just ask Mr. White to yeah. comment, please? Chairman, sorry, I was just, I'd say it's just to be really clear, because obviously we've got two reasons for refusal in front of members. Mm -hmm. I think we've heard about the first reason for refusal. Yeah. It's just how members would wish to deal with the second reason for refusal. Uh, you're talking about the light pollution issue, yeah? Yeah, in terms of impact, potential impact on bats. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that, well, again, that's what I think I passed back to you in terms of what the applicants already offered in terms of using different glazing or using automatic blinds. Um, and I think that that should be fairly straightforward for that to be monitored as well. And, and I think we've done that before with other um, applications and also with screening as well. And I think all those things would contribute. You could get down to specifying um, certain wattage of LED lights inside, everything downlit, no up lighters, nothing pointing through windows. Uh, those sort of things I think would all have those sort of uh, uh, um, effects. So what you're trying to do is, that, is you're trying to, d d to diminish the amount of light spill uh, from those windows um, onto the front of the building. Um, and, uh, and I can think of, and I think it's already been raised, I can think of several ways that that could be done within conditions. Right, thank you. So you're suggesting that that should be overcome by condition? I'm, uh, well, I'm, two things. One, one, I'm suggesting, I don't think it, as I said right in my first comment, I actually don't agree with the report that it is such an issue, given that what we're talking about here is the, I'd say a marginal increase in glazing because of a marginal increase in the size of the building. So we have to accept a baseline where there would be light, light spilling from buildings from a dwelling, just as if think if we go to any settlements next more at night, we're going to see lights on and we're going to see light spilling uh, from those. We do not go around telling all residents next more when they can turn their lights on and off. So I would say the increase in light spillage is not, is not significant enough to cause the rejection of this application for the reasons I gave earlier. But there are also conditions that we could make that the applicant has already indicated they would be amenable to. Okay, thank you. Um, and we'll um, re revert to that in a moment when we've heard another couple of speakers who've now asked to speak. Mr. Yabsley. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> I just wonder whether an occupancy restriction would be appropriate. No. No. <coughs> Sorry, I'm... Uh, I think I would be told by the officer that at the moment it's basically an open market property fine, and therefore fine, you fine, can't fine, oppose fine. it. Mr. Holton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've listened to the uh, arguments um, with great interest today and have sympathy with all, lots of views expressed and very saddened by the reported abuse, etc., etc. I've known this site for very many years and have grown used to the uh, diminished use of the access and the gradual reabsorption of the site by nature. And I understand people's feelings with regard to, to this application. If, if members are minded to um, approve, I think there really should be a construction statement of how access is going to be uh, managed here and how the bill can take place. And I think we will be in dereliction of our duty if we haven't got that sorted out. We've seen the pictures of the lane, the narrowness, the, the ford that's got to be come through, the 
opportunities for damage and for accident here are huge. So I think that has to be a major consideration. Thank you, Mr. Holton. And Dr. Kelly. I, I just want to urge caution in terms of the light impact. Uh, professionally, I've dealt with ecology measures, mitigating impact of lighting on, on bat populations. It's not something that, that can be easily brushed aside. And when you make this decision, I understand the reasons for doing so, but I just draw your attention to the CPRE, their consultation response that talks about five times the amount of glazing being proposed as part of this. It's in addition to the additional nine, month, uh, nine meters of length and the outbuilding that's also being proposed. So it's not something that can easily be set aside or addressed through conditions. And I draw your attention to the CPR response and what was actually said today regarding that particular point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Olsen and then Mr. Bray. Just, to, just again, it speaks to the point you were asking about earlier, and I think it, it answers that. Again, the report does say Natural England have made no objection uh, and have advised the authority to record no likely significant effect. Um, so I, I think we do need to be careful on. I mean, we, we've got evidence to suggest there will be an effect. We've got evidence to suggest there will be no significant effect. Um, so, um, you know, I'm not sure where that leaves us, but I, I think we need to be careful in measuring up that particular evidence and how much weight we want to give to Natural England, of course, is up to us. Thank you. Mr. Bray. Um, just picking up what Jeremy said, and I mentioned before, um, I'm, I'm not sure this can be purely planning or if the National Park is the highway authority. But in making sure that, that if it goes ahead, that it's built in a very safe manner, what I've seen in front of me so far, I don't think we've got that. The construction method statement is currently isn't signed off by anybody, any person. There's no accountability <coughs> there. Um, the vehicle access statement isn't complete, so I think that really needs looking at. Because um, the proposal is, is to use vehicles only about three and a half tons. And time to take away the weight of the vehicle itself, the trailer, gives like a payload of 600 kilograms. So it's being proposed that the lorry is going to be unloaded about four miles away, and 600 kilograms on each load, it's going to be a lot of vehicles going backwards and forwards on that footpath. So I think a risk assessment has to be done on that footpath. As a horse rider, I don't see how you can ride past that when building's going on. I, I just think that would be uh, quite a risky thing to do. The noise, the dust. So I think, again, I'm not sure if it's the National Park is the Highway Authority, had to make sure it's been built safely. But not necessarily planning, but it has to be looked at, I think, again, because what we've got in front of us, I don't think, is, is, is making sure it will be built in a safe way. Uh, well, to be clear, as it says on page 33, there would have to be a construction management plan which would have to be agreed by the authority. Yeah. And that would be one of the conditions. <coughs> Is there anything else, ladies and gentlemen? So, at the moment, then, it has been moved by Mr. Elson and seconded by Mr. Petrinos that this application should actually be approved uh, subject to um, conditions which will be uh, delegated to officers but agreed by the chairman of the planning committee. And it will, after today, be the chairman of the planning committee. Right. Is everybody clear about that? And do I take it um, from the legal and professional aspects that you're happy with that proposal? Okay. In that case, ladies and gentlemen, may I see all those in favour of that proposal to approve with conditions? All those against? And those abstaining? Right, thank you. Two abstentions. So that was 10 votes in favour, five against, two abstentions. So um, that was an extremely interesting debate. Can I thank members for it? Can I thank members of the public?
who attended today and have given so much time and attention to the consideration of this application. Um, it, your participation has been um, very much appreciated. Thank you for that. Um, I'm now going to adjourn the meeting until half past three so that uh, members can have a comfort break and members of the public can leave if they want. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, move on, if we may, please, to item 62-43-23-009. And this is proposed variation of condition two of approved application to extend the hours of operation. And this is at Woody Bay Station, Linton Dunstable Railway. And this is going to be presented by Mrs. Spears. Thank you. The application is brought before the committee um, because the officer recommendation is contrary to the recommendations of the Martin Hoe Parish Meeting and Parish, uh, Parish and Parish Council. The application relates to a building at Woody Bay Station on the Linton and Barnstable Railway. It is the variation of condition two of approved application 6243-23002, which was granted planning consent in September 2023 and relates to the operating hours for the lo locomotive or rolling stock shed only. The rolling stock shed is located to the east of the main station building. It's in the large, largest block of red indicated on the uh, aerial photo uh, photograph and is used for the storage and maintenance of locomotives and carriages. Part of this usage is for the firing up of locomotives prior to the first timetable train. Temporary planning permission was granted in 2003 and again in 2013 for the construction and retention of the rolling stock shed. It should be noted that no restrictions were placed on the hours of usage for the shed under either of these previous applications, which were numbered 62430003 and 62431301. And therefore, the building could be used at any point in the 24-hour period under these permissions. A separate application was submitted and approved in 2013 for the retention of the miniature railway and associated storage shed towards the south of the site. This application refers to the storage building associated with the miniature railway as a covered rolling stock shed and did restrict the hours of use for both the miniature railway and the associated shed to between 9am and 6pm. In July 2023, the most recent application, 6243-23002, was submitted, and that was for the retention of the main locomotive rolling stock shed, the water tank, the miniature railway, and the storage shed also referred to as a rolling stock shed associated with the miniature railway, in perpetuity. This was granted in September 2023. Conditions were appended restricting the hours of use for both the main rolling stock shed and the miniature ro railway rolling stock shed to between the hours of 9am and 6pm. As previously stated, a restriction of our hours of use had previously only been appended to the miniature railway rolling stock shed and not the main rolling stock locomotive shed. In terms of the use of the shed, it is noted that a steam locomotive requires a lengthy period of firing up build up a head of steam safely. It is also noted that this is not an exceptionally noisy process and takes place entirely within the shed and that prior to the present application no complaints have been received relating to noise occurring through the use of the shed. In addition, inspection and routine maintenance work takes place to ensure the smooth and safe running of the locomotives and carriages. The applicants have requested the variation of condition two of the approved permission to allow the use of the main rolling stock locomotive shed only between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. to allow this work to take place outside of the running times of the railway and to allow for the safe firing up of the locomotives prior to the first timetable train of the day. Again, it should probably be noted at this stage that prior to September 2023, 
there were no restrictions on the operating hours and usage of the rolling stock shed, and that in essence the variation of condition will allow the railway to run to the timetable it has for several years. It should also be noted that there will be no variation in the operating hours of the line itself through this application. At present, the permitted running times for the line are between the hours of 9am and 6pm. In practice, the first train departs Woody Bay Station at 10.45am and the last train departs Woody Bay Station at 3pm, as can be seen from this photo. It is understood that there are no plans at this time to alter this timetable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Spears. We have two um, public speakers, um, and the first is Rick Auger. It may be Auger, in which case I apologise. Uh, Auger's fine, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, Mr Auger, you have two minutes from when you start to speak. Thank you. Uh, I'm a retired civil and structural engineer, chartered, and a volunteer. I provide planning and build engineering and building control advice to the railway. Uh, I acted as agent for this application and uh, including the variation request which is being discussed. Uh, the comments from the planning officer uh, comprehensively cover the points which the railway would wish to make. So I'm not to take up too much of the time, but I propose to reiterate, reiterate those points which are of particular importance to the railway. Uh, obviously the railway has been uh, was originally given permission in 1996 uh, and it's been running more or less since then and at the point today where uh, we carry, we, last year we carried 45,000 visitors. Uh, many of those possibly came just to visit the railway and would have uh, visited Exmoor just to visit the railway and would have uh, obviously used local facilities and local uh, refreshment areas. The operation of the, the, steel, the steam locomotives requires sig significant effort to inspect, clean, service, lubricate and prepare the locomotives. Not just to fire up, but they have to be inspected, lubricated uh, and checked over say, for safety reasons every day and then in the evening closed down, uh, shut down, uh, the, the fires stamped down and uh, the engines left ready for the next day. Um, obviously the operations ideally occur in a clean and dry environment and that's what the shed provides. Uh, so we did not have, previously we did not have restrictions on use of the, the shed uh, and on time, from a time point of view and this has caused some problems in discussing with the operational staff. Uh, they do need those two hours. Uh, it's not just, with, not just for uh, uh, getting them ready for the, those particular train times that were are listed, but obviously the, in certain circumstances we could have problems with uh, weather uh, and failures on the line, so we'd need that bit more time to actually get the locos back and then okay. close them down. Um, Mr Orgo, you've had your two yeah. minutes in a bit yeah. over, so if you could bring your remarks to a conclusion, <laughs> please. Yeah. And just, just the point, yeah, that, that uh, We've got those normal times listed up there, but obviously the, the additional times between nine and six for operating uh, would allow for occasional special use at Christmas or uh, galas or for uh, uh, special trains, other special events. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Orger. Thank you. And our next speaker is Marge Ash. And this is actually, you've got two minutes from when you start to speak. Thank you. I'm reading the comments of my friend Amanda Tassel. I would like to begin by asking why the railway believes these three, these three additional hours, which they say are necessary for essential maintenance and health and safety, are suddenly needed after operating without them for 20 years. Are they saying that for two decades they have not been doing this essential maintenance or carrying out health and safety checks? Secondly, they have said in their application that this work will not impact the locals or neighbouring properties and that there will be no excessive noise or movement on the site. However, unless I am naive in this, 
The shed in question is wood and certainly not soundproof, so any machinery or use of metal tools, etc., will be heard, especially in the early hours when it is normally quiet and the sound will carry further and be more noticeable. We will also, of course, have cars on the road earlier than normal, <coughs> as the volunteers have to travel to the site and then any voices will be heard. Is it right that a tourist attraction, which has said it is working well and continuing to grow, has the right to basically be operating in an area of outstanding nat natural beauty for 12 hours every day, preventing locals and visitors alike from enjoying any sort of peace and quiet in daylight hours? Perhaps before Exmoor National Park allows further applications from the railway to be heard, they should actually refer back to the original planning applications and promises made by the railway and see how many of these have been kept or adhered to. I should like to add a further observation, which is this. When driving along the A39 as I pass by Woody Bay Station, I find it depressing to see what has increasingly become an industrial site, which is both jarring, that word again, and uh, inappropriate in the context of a beautiful landscape. There appears to have been little or no thought given to screening. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, members, your consideration, please. Mr. Petrinos. Thanks. Well, I can understand why an application by the railway has garnered a response because there's a long planning history, not, around this, not only around this site, but around all the other applications coming in from the railway, and they, that have served to um, fire up community in both in support and um, objection. Uh, so I can imagine, I wasn't at the meeting, that even though this is in my patch um, that I represent, I wasn't at the parish meeting or the, the parish council meeting that objected, but I can see that perhaps there has been possibly, in my view, unwarranted concern because of the lack of understanding that this wasn't a new, this wasn't an additional um, time. In fact, one of the responses talked about, you've been doing it for 20 years, why change it? But actually, it, it seems to have been changed last autumn, almost inadvertently, I don't know. But, for, but I mean, I read the report from then, and it didn't seem to explain the the reasons for extending the time limits um, beyond uh, what they beyond the non-existing one. It's possible that I and you perhaps can that it's because the previous ones were a temporary um, application. Or I, I don't know, um, but I think that the the, the con local concern might be unwarranted because it's always been like this for the last 20 years until this winter. Uh, that's just my guess. Right, thank you, Mr. Jones. This is Joko. Um, thank you. Um, I'm trying to understand from reading it whether this is what's always been happening anyway, and if I look at the times there, I know firing up and getting trains ready, in my head, takes probably two to three hours, um, and they must have been doing it already to hit the timetable that they had. So I'm trying to ascertain whether this is just getting things in order um, or whether they are actually doing something different. But if I look at the timetable, I can't see that they're going to be doing anything different. There will be a little bit of noise, people arriving, a door opening and closing. Uh, but my understanding is train-wise, they don't actually create a lot of noise until they're fully fired up and ready to uh, move. So my question is, is there a change? Or is, has this already been happening for a time that's just getting the yeah. paperwork in order? Thank you. Um, Mrs. Spears. Oh, come back on that. No, it was just, it is just to, to confirm, that was to clarify that really, Chairman. I mean, it was up until 2023, uh, the trains we've operated as they proposed to through this application. It, it was because they're two rolling stock sheds, the miniature one's subject to time restriction, which is still would be the case. The larger rolling stock shed wasn't, but through that 2003 application, they got lumped together. Oh. This would separate them back out, so revert it back to what it was okay. pre that previous application. Thank you. Mr. Ellicott. 
I'd like to make a proposal that we, rec uh, we approve the officer's recommendations for this application, please. Um, it seems ironic to me that the nearest property to the uh, railway sheds is the Morland Hotel, and they've had no complaints from them about this particular aspect. Right, so proposed by Mr. Ellicott, um, seconded by Mr. Keen. Okay. Dr. Kelly, did you want to? Well, I would have seconded it. Um, Anyway, um, it, it seems to me we've just been told there were no restrictions prior to September 2023. It seems to be you know, sort of a, an accident that they were imposed, I suppose. Um, in terms of the reasons, I've looked at the Parish Council concerns. Uh, they've just been given to us, um, and they've been stated very clearly, but uh, the application documentation does say that. Uh, and in terms of any concerns, um, the Environmental Health Officer has been consulted and recorded no objections, so I'm very happy to... To third, the uh, <laughs> recommendation. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. Uh, is there anybody else who wishes to speak? If not, it's been proposed by Mr. Ellicott, seconded by Mr. Gein, that we sh should approve this variation of condition. <coughs> May I see all those in favour, please? You know? Ah, no, no, no. yes. So, um, with one abstention. Thank you very much. Okay, so that stands approved. We will move on then, if we may, ladies and gentlemen, to item 14, which are the delegated decisions. And we have two pages of them this month. Is there anything on page one which anybody wishes to ask a question about or draw our attention to? What about the um, prior notification of the mast at Paul's Farm? Um, sorry, I shouldn't have sprung that on one, you know, that one on you, Mr. White, but that has been a very controversial application, hasn't it? Subject to the site visit that many of us went on. That's correct. I mean, it was, a, it was an appeal on it in the end, wasn't yeah. it? Um, so, yeah, so yeah. obviously the, the mast was allowed at appeal. It's part of the shared rural network. Uh, the last has been identified as a structure that could accommodate the four main providers. Uh, so this application is, if you like, come about as a result of that. It's a, an increase in height of the structure, it says in the description. It takes up to 14 point, uh, sorry, 14, 17.4 metres, approved at 15. But that, what that allows is, is the three, three antennas to be put on there to deliver um, equipment for the four main networks. And this seems to be a pattern, doesn't it, that um, the emergency services masks, masks are now having the shared rural network antennae added, yeah. which is beneficial to Exmoor. On that page? Yes, Mrs. Yes, Shirtle. Yeah, just for me, and um, we've refused um, some uh, a retrospective for creation of a dormer. So that's been refused. Oh, page. Oh, I'm showing page two. No, this is page two. Oh, sorry. Move on to page two. Sorry, I thought you said page two. Oh, right, sorry. Stop, ignore me. Thank you, Chair. I was more curious on... I was very surprised about the um, list of building consent for defibrillator, and I would have thought there would have been some committed to that, but I just... Uh, it's more like curiosity that they needed planning permission for a defibrillator on the wall. Mm. Mm. Question uh, on the one in Whitman Courtney uh, where list of building consent not required. Mm -hmm. Does that mean they can go ahead and build the summer house or they have to get planning permission for that? Yeah, approved with conditions. Oh, yes. oh it's the building. The building's freestanding, so it didn't need lift the building consent. It just needs planning permission. Yeah, good. And that's just outside the curtains, so it wasn't. It didn't affect the building. Actually, it's within the curtains, but it's freestanding, so it doesn't physically attach to the building. Just needs planning permission. So you can see the impact of the building through that, but it doesn't need separate building consent. Okay. Page two, Mrs. Shilker. <laughs> 
a separate question now about defibrillators. Uh, just a question. Um, we obviously welcome them wherever they are in the community. Now, is it possible to have it in the policy that we will just accept defibrillators or, you know, just, uh, just to ask the question because it seems a really sensible thing for communities and it would save communities having to go through the process. I'll just ask that question. Yeah, so I mean, under the list of building out, I guess, it, it is, it's works for building, which technically requires, requires list of building consent. There's no fee for that, and mm. actually okay. officers, if we have got concerns, will work for a situation where we don't have concerns, but it, in this case, it's just straightforward, but it's a process they need to go through, and um, it was found to be fine. Okay, just like lack of process, if it's an obvious, mm. we'll leave the process in place. My second question, I think, was about the dormer, uh, it was refused, it was retrospective, what happened? <laughs> yeah, so, um, Chairman, that's, uh, we've actually had discussions with the, the applicant since the decision was made, um, and we're looking at what they may be able to do to make changes to the DORMA, so it would be acceptable. They still need an application, okay, but if we can get a better design, so it has to change what's there, then that's what we're working towards. But ultimately, if we can't, then it could be required to take the DORMA Anything else on page two, ladies? Yes, Mr. Key. The final one, um, retrospective agricultural building withdrawn. And that made me wonder, is this anything to do with, with, with scale, with emissions? Because how would that happen? So if somebody's built a shed, and they get full planning retrospectively, do they then... I think they've reached the conclusion that they might be able to get a certificate of lawful use on it. So they've withdrawn oh. the planning application and gone for a QED. Can I, clue out. Yes. Can I ask a question then? What would happen in that situation, Joe? If, if, if um, somebody built a shed without planning, and then would they then mm. be able to use it, or what would the mm. situation be? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if they go for a clue, so a different lawfulness, or argue it's not been there for long enough. Yeah, but if not, if it's not, so, so the application as it stood did have a problem with scale. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm so, and, and as part of that process, now obviously we knew it had been, the, the application admits it had been put up beforehand, we can see it, it's on site. As part of the process, the applicants now sort of dug a bit deep about when they might have done the building and discovered actually, I think it was in there maybe even six years ago. So they would now seek a civil lawfulness to say the building's lawful. Um, in dealing with that, I mean, it, that's not guaranteed, they make the application, but in dealing with that, we're not looking necessarily at planning merits, we're looking at the facts of the case, i.e., has it been there for that time, for that time to mean it's no longer, or it will be becoming new from the course. Mm. If it's not, then they've got an issue. They've got, issue. got to deal with scale. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not worried, I'm just going to dump my... <laughs> we won't tell Mr. Gein. <laughs> right. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Kradis, your pen is poised in the air. Yeah, it's sort of poised. I was just I've noticed the being in Delverton being converted into a residential dwelling, which I suppose is, yeah, it's in a town in Delverton. I'm, I'm just want to check with them. Um, and then I was reading down, so oh, there's a hotel there being converted into. And that's in Martinhoe, and I'm thinking, is that how's that class? Is that class as open countryside in New Dwelling, or is Martinhoe? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, just clarification, really. Because would that be class as a new dwelling in the open countryside? Well, obviously not. Yeah, it's a We have we have a we have a policy which allows. I mean, it was formerly a dwelling house, went to a hotel, and now it's going back to a dwelling house. Which we have a policy which allows that to happen. Mr. Olson. Thank you. Uh, just a quick one. Um, just regarding, I just want to put this sensitively, but regarding some conversation that happened on Facebook recently about an application, um, which you may or may not have seen. This is regarding another mast, I think up near Wedding Cross, is that right? Um, there was some conversation on one of the Facebook groups. It got a little bit spicy. Um, and uh, to the point where Facebook moderators had to step in um, because it actually breached Facebook guidelines um, and it included, I'm afraid to say, some uh, rather unsavoury comments about the head of planning and possibly even about the chair of the planning committee. 
Um, the issue here, I think, is perhaps I just want to say it's in a public meeting because I think we should record the fact that this is not acceptable. Um, and also maybe to remind particularly people, parish members, people maybe who are more plugged into what's going on in parish and are on their parish Facebook groups, that if they see this kind of thing going on, they've really got to you know, get involved and just point out to people that this is not a helpful way um, to discuss upcoming planning applications. Indeed not. Which, um, do we know what it might have been or about? Do we need I would say you don't need to know, and I'd, uh, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. I think it's, it's more, it's, if, it, if it breached Facebook's moderator guidelines, <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be pretty bad. Um, and uh, so, you know, that, I think that's, that's an issue. It, it, all, it all got a bit out of hand, um, and, you know, and unfortunately there were, yeah, there was, there was some names on it that some of us would recognise, and that it, it's, not, it's not right. Um, and, but I, it, it's a, a case, I think, of where, yeah, if we see that happening on these Facebook groups, particularly where it relates to a planning application, but British really about anything that's to do with the park, we've mm. seen it before, then, um, then, then I think, um, yeah, it's just a reminder here in the public forum that that, that, that does not help us uh, do our development planning in the park. So those of you that do Facebook, please take note. Do you want your uh, microphone still, produ still to be on, Mrs. Chilcott? If not, it's the sun. How unusual. Uh, but Mr. Braze is on. Yes. I know we're not used to it. John, <laughs> yes. I did hear in the pub uh, about a mass, but it wasn't Wedding Cross. It was at Hurdle Down up on the moors. That's it. Sorry, Hurdle. Hurdle yeah, Down. That's the big one, yes. Um, I didn't know it had gone to Facebook. Hurdle Down ended up near Eldonsborough up on the common. Um, yes, I haven't seen it, but it was reported in the as well. So that maybe that's what it was, and I, right. I, I didn't know anything about it, but I, must yeah. not, I wouldn't get involved in the Facebook. If I did see something, I must admit, no, but um, good, good point. But the question... I'm listening. The, the, yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you've virtually covered it, Joe. but I just wanted to clarify. The Dormer issue about refusal, Dormer's in principle are okay. It's just a, a, a not acceptable one. It's an ugly one. And if they refine it, it can be acceptable. It's a flat roof storm which the design was, was poor. I mean, they have the right to appeal, which they might still exercise, but if they're equally discussing with officers, you know, so we're seeking to find a solution if we can. Right, ladies and gentlemen, um, if there's nothing else, um, may I thank you for your participation in the last ever full authority planning consideration after 50 odd years plus of this happening in this way. We will have a standalone planning committee uh, from April. So the next. <laughs> it just feels that way, Mr. Elson. Um, but um, seriously, it, it is an historic moment. So I thank you all very much for your participation uh, today. And we have actually had a very interesting series of items to consider. And um, if I might say so, I think that the debate has been uh, very good. Um, and so I thank you very much for your contribution both today and in the past. And um, I look forward to seeing those of you that will be on the planning committee at the next meeting. Although, of course, I think it is open for anybody to attend it, so please do feel free to come and uh, barrack us from the, um, from the, from the galleries. Thank you so much. I look forward to that. Um, so, uh, I presume there's no site visits required. Uh, we don't know, but if there are, they will be um, actually not on Friday the 29th of March, because that is Friday. Good Friday. They will be on the 5th of April, should they be required. Um, yes, Mrs. Shilgram. Just to clarify, we'll all still get the paperwork so we'll get it paid online if we wish to. I'm assuming so. Yes. So, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I will hand over to the Chairman of the Authority to close the meeting. Thank you for your forbearance today. It's been really useful, nice debate, everything polite and respectful. Thank you. Safe journey home. Thank you.